Good day viewers, Walter here. I'm trying to I've been producing a series of videos on my life as a railway carman and this is part four and I'll just pick right up where I left off. If I think about it I'll put a link to all the other parts in the description below because I'm not sure how many parts this um, this journal is gonna be. As I think back on my memories or when I actually began to work for the railroad. It was September 1969. I'm reminded of many things, and I'm sure I have forgotten many things as well. Let's briefly ask this, what my situation was at the time. I had just completed a four-year tour of active duty with the United States Navy. When I entered the Navy at 18 years old, I weighed a whopping 157 pounds and was probably about five, five foot six. Now four years had passed and I was six feet four inches tall and was probably close to 200 pounds in body weight. I recall I did not have even a pot to pee in. I had no civilian clothes, neither work or dress clothing, or even a pair of work boots. I had a few dollars in my pocket, but no place to live. I was now a single man in the huge city of Atlanta, Georgia, and was facing an uncertain future and no friends to rely on. My parents lived well over a hundred miles farther north in the town of Morganton, Georgia. What I did have was a new job in my 1969 white over lime green mercury montego it was a v8 302 cubic inch gasoline consuming ford product what few dollars i had had to be stretched a bit as i had to feed myself as well as the vehicle i was driving i needed a place to stay as well it would be a couple of weeks before my first paycheck would come in in fact, it was a month, I guess, because they hold back two weeks. They only pay every two weeks. As I reflect, I probably had it a bit rougher than most, but I'm certain many of my viewers and subscribers here on YouTube may have had similar circumstances when they were first out on their own. I answered a newspaper ad and rented a small efficiency apartment that was in the back basement area of an older home on Maple Street in Atlanta. I stayed there a couple of months before moving into more unworthy of mentioning digs in the Smyrna, Georgia area. Living conditions during those first few months with the railroad were not the greatest. I got by mainly because of my use of what is often referred to as the company store. So I will talk about the company store a bit here. It was truly a company store. I am not exactly sure who owned it, but it was called Sands and & Company, and in those days, there was a Sands & Company near most of the railroad main yards. The physical building or store was small and not much to look at, but you could buy just about anything you needed there. It would be deducted straight from your railroad paycheck. I doubt any still exists, but Many railroad families used it to get by when times got tough. Let's take a moment or two and talk about the store. For those of my readers who may be too young to remember or never heard of a company store, I will elaborate a bit. The idea of a company store goes back many years and was a common practice, especially in rural areas where it was a one company oriented community. A good example would be at coal mines. Since the railroads haul all the coal, it stands to reason the railroads also had company stores. The Atlanta Sands and Company was a small building on Marietta Street. It was just outside the main entrance to the Southern Railway Inn and Yards. It didn't take me long to learn of the place, and I was quickly hooked. It was very well stocked. Had and they had access to just about anything a railroader might need. 
there were groceries, clothing, a butcher shop, work clothes and equipment such as coveralls, work boots, hats, belts, gloves, batteries, whatever you needed. If they didn't have it, they could get it for you. If you had a job, you had instant credit. If you say, we don't need company stores anymore, you're probably wrong. In today's modern society, company stores just got replaced by what what they call credit cards. Just about everybody has some of those these days. And I'm sure quite a few of them use them to get by. I not only bought my groceries, meat, boots, and gloves, I even once purchased tires for my car there. They just sent me to an area tire store to get them and I repaid the company store rather than the tire store. I do recall the meat we purchased from there was prime cut, excellent stuff. You can't buy that quality stuff in most grocery stores these days. But I have gotten off track just a little bit in my story. I was going to talk about my first day on the job and that's where I'll pick up. I worked in the forwarding yard that day packing boxes. Packing boxes is a railroad term referred to oil and servicing friction bearing journal boxes that house the axles and wheel bearings on the rail cars. Nowadays everything is primarily roller bearing wheels. I remember the outbound train I worked that day was probably a good mile long and almost entirely friction bearing wheels, so there was a lot of them to service. Basically, we just used the packing paddle to straighten the loop pads under the journals, poured some oil in those that needed it, and slapped the lids closed. I quickly adapted great disdain for this particular job. I walked along in the rough gravel with my oil soaked, quickly ruined gloves, and navy dress shoes that I wore were quickly ruined as well. I walked along mumbling to myself, what the hell have I got myself into? This particular part of the job really sucks. I was walking down track three and approaching the area of the yard known as eight speaker. There were speakers scattered throughout the train yard so we could communicate with the foreman. Track one and track two were wide open, meaning there was nothing in them. I had a clear view of a small metal shack at eight speaker where the carmen hung out. The ones that worked there on the trains were hung out there. Two men I didn't know were standing outside of it. One was a carman on duty there, and I later learned the other one was an off-duty car foreman by the name of Carl Abercrombie. I will just refer to him in the future as Ab. Ab was obviously three sheets to the wind. He was holding a gallon of Jack Daniels whiskey. Ab yelled to me, Hey, car man, do you want a drink? Come on over. I replied, No thanks, bub. I ain't ready to lose this job yet. I thought again to myself, What the hell have I got myself into? That'll conclude part four. Your comments would be appreciated. And I hope some of you are following along with this journal as I produce it. This people all part wish everybody well.